Hi everyone and welcome to What A Flanker, the podcast series two. Now my guest today is one of the biggest names in the world of DJing. He's been at the top of his game for over 40 years. He's known as one of the nicest people in the music industry. I'm a huge fan, I'll try and control myself. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the legend that is Carl Cox. <laughs> well, thank you for that intro. It's absolutely amazing. I'm really happy to be here, James. And thanks for asking me to be here uh, to talk to yourselves. It's been long overdue. And your, your wife really is, is an amazing person. You know, at the end of the day, because she made it happen, okay? Not she you. She did. No, I know. She did, okay? I well, know. Well, I have, to, I have to give a bit of context. I have to give a bit of context to that. So, obviously, for those people who, who uh, follow me know that I've got into DJing and I've been a fan of music for a a while I've got into production recently, but obviously uh, one of my DJing heroes I talked about when I was in the jungle and I'm a celebrity was obviously the, the man I've got on the podcast today, Carl Cox. And my wife, unbelievably <laughs> for a birthday, contacted Carl to ask him, would he give me a DJ lesson or would he spend some time with me? And um, first of all, what an incredible man he actually got back to her. So if it wasn't for my wife who gave me the ultimate present, we wouldn't be here today. Um, <laughs> so otherwise I would have probably been arrested for stalking. So it's Carl, it's great to be here. <laughs> Um, albeit via digital link, so you don't have to be in the in person. You're not that comfortable to make sure you can't be here in case I get a bit weird, which is always which is always good. So, so where are you in the world? Right, well, right now I am in Melbourne, Australia, and I've been here, um, you know, since the pandemic, since this time last year. Um, and I, I, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people know that I spend a lot of time here every year. Um, I bought a house uh, in a place called Mornington Peninsula, here uh, just south of the city. It's a beautiful place. It's really gorgeous. And um, uh, since 2003, so I've been kind of going back and forth. And what I try and do, James, actually, is to miss the winters in, in Europe. That's what I try and do. And uh, and so I'm, I'll kind of come back. I'll sneak back into the UK around about April, May. And I go, ah, there we go. Ah, a bit of sun. And then I'm all the way there through until about September, October. And I go, oh, 18 degrees. Right, let's go. And <laughs> jump on a flight, wee, back to Australia. And it's like spring, summer in Australia. I'm like, yoo So the idea really, James, is that I just end up keeping my colour up. That's, that's what I do. Mate, that's, that is a great plan. And do you know what? I made a mistake of, we had a couple of days of sunshine here. And I came to London to record these podcasts. And I turned up with only T-shirts. And I've been walking <laughs> from the hotel to where I am in five degrees. And it, even people are like stopping going, I don't think you're quite right in the head. So I, I like what you're doing. I need to be more successful to chase the summer, I think. <laughs> It can be done. I'm sure it can. <laughs> I'm sure it can be done. Um, but how are you anyway? Because obviously, I imagine for somebody who is as busy as you were, it's been like someone has just pulled the handbrake up on on the nightlife scene. So how how are you? Like how are you mentally? How are you physically? Yeah, I mean, you know, that's a really good analogy. Pulling the handbrake up, it, it feels like they pulled the handbrake up and done like, and it's and, it, and the three sixes are, are still keep going, you know, <laughs> for, for a whole year. Um, you know, it's been difficult, I have to say, because unfortunately throughout all of this, my father died also in the middle of it all. And I wasn't able to go and see him um, you know, with the funeral. I had to basically watch him um, have, have the service on YouTube uh, and just outside of my birthday as well. And I'm just like, blimey, can it get any worse? You know, I thought my dad was been been ill for quite a while. Uh, he's been suffering through dement with dementia. Um, and, and I was just like, I can't believe that I'm not able to really see him you know based on what's happened here as well so it was a bit of a double whammy really you know based on what's happened and nobody was prepared or ready for any of this you know i was in america doing my first american kind of club tour for the last 10 years and it was all going well and i got to houston texas and i sat there watching the tv and donald trump was there telling people that look, we're really sorry, we're going to close the borders, there is a, some sort of pandemic, it, it seemed to be quite serious, um, but anyone needs to get out, get out now, anyone that's staying here, we're going to lock everything down. And I'm just thinking, wow, this is really serious. So, you know, I jump on the plane, I thought, what, now do I go to the UK, do I go to Australia? So, I went to Australia, I jumped on the flight from Houston, we managed to get a flight quite quickly to, from Houston to Los Angeles, and then, to, then, then when we got to Los Angeles, the uh, flight attendant goes, right, you know, uh, if you do get on this flight, you're going to be self-quarantining for, for two weeks. I'm like, self-quarantining for two weeks? What am I going to do for two weeks? This is impossible. I want to get back at it. Anyway, I thought, all right, well, we get off the plane and get, get in the car, get home, and then don't go out for two weeks. I mean, I haven't done that since I was at school. You know what I mean? When I was about 14, 15 years old. It's like, how do you do that? You know, anyway, so I got back to my house in Australia 
There was no food in the kitchen. Friends of mine were bringing food around parcels. You can't go out in mark. They were in masks and stuff and, and then social distancing. And I'm like, oh my God, it really is crazy. And what's even worse is that, that they said, you really do have to stock up on toilet paper. And I'm thinking, things are getting really <laughs> toilet paper. <laughs> I'm like, what is, what is happening? So, so, so I'm stocked up with toilet paper and, and I sat in my house and watching the news and just seeing the whole world go to crap. And I'm just like, wow. Uh, what do we do here? So I thought, well, the best thing for me to do was that I got my record collection here in my garage, um, and the whole thing. And, and what's kept me sane, to be honest, in some ways, is that I'm able to still share the love of my music through the social media. Was the internet? Was the me picking up my phone and then going right? I'm going to go live and I'm going to play these records that I've had in here for years and years, and just enjoy the moment of 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 the ideal of that that I've got to a place where I'm able to do this right now. And and that's how basically Cabin Fever, the final session was born. Um, Cause I just didn't want to really just just do a, a, a live stream for live stream's sake. I think people know who I am. I think people know I can mix 10 turntables, 15, 20, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, I think, I, think, I think people know who Carl Cox is. So it doesn't matter now. I'm going to play the music that got me here. Funk, soul, disco, hip hop, 80s, funk, soul, jazz, jazz, funk, uh, te hard techno, all the elements, breaks, drum and bass. I've got it all, all on vinyl. And it's been a revelation, to be honest. But I was only supposed to do like, I said, I'll do, I'll do you know, one a week for four weeks, like a month. And then it's like two months, three months, four months, five months, change venue to my studio. And today, right now, I'm up to show number 51. Can you believe it that it's gone this far a whole That's year? Insane. And, and every single show is on vinyl. Every single track is either produced, uh, not produced, it's either mixed by me and curated. And every single thing that you see, it's a one-shot deal, James. As soon as I put that first record on, it gets recorded like that. There's no edits. There's no top and tailing. You know, I, I do some spiel at the beginning. I don't even know what I say. I'll just go, yeah, there's my records. <laughs> you know, I'm going to play this this week. And bang, there it is, you know. And and it's just been amazing. And we, DJ Meg was... Um, were really uh, behind the show, and and they they you know we won a best solo stream uh, for the for the uh, uh, DJ Mag uh, best of British, which I thought was fantastic. I'm not anywhere near you near the UK, and here I am with, winning this award because of it. So there's a lot of goodness there, but the, all of this kept me sane. It's been keeping me sane uh, based on where I am. But now I've been making a lot of music in my studio. I've been doing a lot of remixes. Uh, as well for a lot of artists um, and look, I'm looking to sign a new record deal eventually uh, with a label which I can't uh, mention at the moment but it's, it's this close and it's looking really good the last time they, sat, they signed me was 30 years ago so that might give you a, a, a chance to think who that could be but because of all of this <laughs> this is what's been this is what's been happening so and again again I mean my my um, my uh, my vegetable garden I've been growing vegetables chilies I've been chives and thyme all this <laughs> eggplant and potatoes. I'm like, where did I become a gardener? And, uh, and that can basically grow things. And also my kitchen skills, banana bread, you know, uh, with shepherd's pie, uh, 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 chicken and mushroom soup. And I'm a bit of a chef actually, I can cook. Um, but all of this has come out because of the pandemic. So yeah, uh, I, I, I'm trying to just keep, you know, me, uh, the momentum of, of who I am going. And, uh, and hopefully on a day-to-day -day basis, we can get back to where we would like to be, you know, where we were from before, which obviously will change. But uh, right now, this is where I am. But mate, this is, do you know what, this is what I love about you and why everybody who in the music industry or fans of you, just your infectious energy, you know, to start that conversation, to say, sadly, you lost your your father, which, you know, uh, I'm going to please, you know, to take my condolences for that, obviously in a really difficult period. And I know a lot of people who listen have lost loved ones and just it's such an odd world we live in where you just say you know you can't go and celebrate somebody's funeral you can't go and celebrate life you've got to watch it virtually and all those kind of those stuff but for you to roll on to that and, and use kind of your mental strength I mean were there were there any moments that it, it got to you a little bit because everything you've said is kind of what I my approach to life which is if you keep momentum a bit like a shark if a shark stops swimming it dies you seem mm -hmm. like you've gone right I'm going to deal with this and then we're going to do this and then we're going to do this and you sort of filled your time is that how you deal with with th those pressure moments and things like that well you know I know my mum because my mum also died as well five years ago I know what it's like to move on from it obviously you have your feelings about losing your parents in such a way but they're upstairs somewhere 
uh, going, son, this is this is who you are, and we would not want you to stop being who you are. And and if that's, that's being a DJ, sharing a love of music, that's what we want you to do. So it, it's his spirit that drives me at the end of the day. They're not here physically. I can't pick the phone up and say hi, how are you doing or anything. They're just not here. But they're but they're, they're, the spirit of them is, is in is in me, and I just drive that spirit because of them. And and what was really cleansing in some ways, and what probably one of the most difficult shows I've ever done in my life is where I did a a tribute show for my father on cabin fever, and we had the uh, prime minister of Barbados, because my family from Barbados also uh, showed condolences by having a Zoom meeting with me um, throughout the show, which was like, you know, we heard that, that the Prime Minister was, was, was also very interested in, in you know, supporting me and based on what's happened. And, you know, behind me, we set up the video and, and the microphone and everything, talking to her. And I'm thinking, how the hell am I talking to the Prime Minister of Barbados about my father that's just died? And, and here I am, you know, with the show, that all the music that I like, curated for the show is all my dad's records, the, the music that I grew up with, that I listened to. And every single tune that I played was because of his record collection. It was his music. So it was very, very hard to do that show. And everyone felt it when I when I when I did it. And afterwards I was just bawling my eyes out. I was just like, whew, I mean, I was it was very tough, man. Very, very tough place to be at that particular time. Yeah, I can, look, I can I can only you know, I can only imagine how difficult that was being. I think you know, like you're right, they're looking down wherever they are and would and celebrate that. What a tribute, you know, to be able to share his music and his and his taste because that's what I wanted to ask you about. So everybody knows the man we see today, right? But obviously I was quite late to kind of music and, and um I want to know where it all sort of started for you. You know, was it obviously you've mentioned your dad into records, was that what sparked you into music? Was your mum into music? Like what what yeah. what created the Carl Cox we see today? Well, I, I think James, more than anything, it, it, my family are, are from the Caribbean and they're very, you know, happy go lucky people. Uh, they 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 used to uh, every year celebrate uh, the island because they, they the island is just uh, full of sugar cane. So they used to harvest all the sugar cane. And then uh, at the end of, of their harvest, they used to have a celebration called Crop Over. And Crop Over was just like, a, like not in a carnival of, of Barbados. There'd be all the floats and everyone dancing around, they'd dance to Calypso music and soca. And my parties at home, mum and dad's home, was always like that. It was like the Crop Over every time they had a, a party at the house. So, <laughs> so I was like seven, eight years old and I'm upstairs in my room. This is in the UK, in Carl Shorten in, 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 in Surrey. And... Um, I know I hear all this music being played downstairs, you know, Think by Aretha Franklin, you know, Get Up Off of That Theme by James Brown and all this music. And my mum and dad's friends are screaming and smoking. Oh, I don't know what they're doing. You know? And I'm just like, I'm trying to get asleep here. You know what I mean? It's like, anyway, so I remember coming down to Bannisters one night and, and I was just looking at them all, you know, just thinking, my God, you know, this is a real scene. And my dad saw me and he, and he went up and he, he said to me, he said, look, son, is what is I you can either do one or two things. You can either go to bed or you can come downstairs and put these records on and don't move until I tell you. So I was like, Yes, I'm gonna come downstairs and put these records on and and see them all dancing to my selection, sort of thing. And that's how it started. I was, you know, basically child <laughs> child slave labor for my father to put the but, but a child on. slave's labor selector. You were already a selector at the early age, like the pressure. Because you know what parents like? First of all, they let you out of bed, which you shouldn't be out of bed. And secondly, no. they put the whole pressure of the night on. And you don't you probably didn't know what you were looking at in terms of the music. So you go and pull yeah. some weird off 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 piece jazz record on and changes the vibe completely. That was a good early lesson for like DJ. That's amazing. Yeah, I was very eclectic in my very uh, early age, to the point that I, what, I was really interested in, in who Dwayne Eddy was, who Elvis Presley was, who Sam and Dave was, and uh, Diana Ross and the Supremes, and all this sort of stuff. So I used to go record shopping with my dad, and then, and then you know, hear the different tam sounds through Tamala Motown, or Stax Records, or the Philly sound, and all this sort of stuff. So eventually, I just used to listen to red radio, with the headphones, just listen to Tommy Vance on, on Luxembourg, or or I used to listen to early BBC Radio 1 or Radio Jackie, all this sort of stuff. I just constantly listened to music and then write down the titles of them and then go and find them uh, to, to be able to play as my own collection, within my father's collection. And eventually, my, do my dad stopped buying records and he trusted my collection selection to play the music to his family and friends. So 
that's that's how it happened. And, and when did you think you wanted to do this more seriously? Because everybody I've talked to, some of the, the incredible DJs I've been lucky enough to talk to, a lot of them say the parents were the influence on, in their music. Had a real, you know, that, that that was it. Their friends were obviously into it. But this, kind, I want to talk about the record uh, going to record shops in in a second. But when did you actually go? I want to be a DJ because when I was talking to Alan Fitzpatrick, he was saying that it was his first gigs were to his three mates in his bedroom, and they were all into it, and they would rotate round, and one of them would go, "This is shit. This is good," and that's how he sort of got got into it. You were playing to your parents. Uh, and obviously, probably quite loving the fact that if you put on a record, the screams would go, the screams would go louder, the dancing would get more aggressive. And and you know, was that what made you want to do it permanently? The thing it was just a, a, a bit of giggle. It got me got me out of bed to do something that I was experiencing and enjoying. Um, but at the time, you, you just need money, you know, to do to buy records or to buy a sound system or anything to do with uh, being able to play this music to an audience. So I had the same scenario. As, as Alan, when I used to have something in my bedroom and the boys would come around, listen to music, and I'd play music to them. Um, but then at the same time, I was always in the building trade. I was I was an, an odd carrier. Um, I would be uh, mucking, mucking for uh, plasterers. Um, I, I would um, be a labourer for... Uh, well, I was actually a chippy's mate for ages. And you know what? One thing I hated about being a chippy's mate, we used to do this, this, this thing... Uh, where we were building the roofs and you had to put the the, the, the wood between the slats and, and then knock the nails in so you could put the, the, the tiles on. I actually hit my thumb every bloody time. Bam! And I was like, right, I'm definitely not going to be a bloody chippy. That's for sure. I hate this job. Uh, but I did it because I was earning good money. And my last job was actually, um, was being a labourer for a scaffolding firm which, to the point that I took over the the, the, the role of... of um, of, of, of running two gangs and eventually not just one, two, but I used to drive the truck, load it up, go to the jobs, put up all the 20 by 20s on my own, all that sort of stuff. And, and to be honest, it was kind of encroaching on my DJ work on the weekends, but I would always do birthday parties, school discos, uh, some weddings at that particular time when I was 14, 15, 16 years old, and then 17, 18 years old when I was basically uh, scaffolding. And you know, here's another story. So Twickenham, um, which you know very well, the rug, rugby rugby place. Um, in nineteen, I think eighty two, eighty three, I did the scaffolding all round it, just so we could basically make the make the tin roof so they can paint the bloody thing. So, <laughs> oh my so god! That's, so that's so Twickenham was a, Twickenham was, was put up by Carl Cox. What? Uh, what? Scaffolding, <laughs> yeah, scaffolding around Twickenham was put up by me, and we nearly died actually because we put in one of the tubes on, and wind took took one of the tubes. It went over the side when it was about. 40 foot up and and we all we all had to just run inside the, the of the the building so the tube went outside all we could do was ding 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 and uh yeah uh, that was it i nearly died there <laughs> oh my god well, i've ne- listen i've nearly died there a few times as well yeah. mainly getting mainly because i got yellow card and the crowd wanted to beat me up but apart from that um what just 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 talk too quickly about you know that obviously most some people go straight from something to without having a career in the real world. Like for example, rugby players back in the day when they was when it was semi professional, they used to have careers as well. So for example, mm-hmm. I would I would train Tuesday Thursday nights, but I would be a lawyer, right? Obviously, right. in the modern era, we were, all I've ever known is being a professional sportsman, but I've always done work outside of it. You yeah. had a, you had a life before you became the biggest name in DJ. Do you ever get message? Has anyone ever gone, one of your old gang, and gone, Carl, do you remember us? We used to be putting scaffold out, used to drive the van, used to shout at everyone. Do you ever get anything like that? All the bloody time. <laughs> I get it all the time. Oi, Coxie, you know. Uh, <laughs> we remember you, you know, when uh, when uh, used to go to, we used to go to a place called Cliff's Caff in Roseville. <laughs> Love okay. it, yeah. Cliff, Cliff's Caff, and so... We used to go in there and and get like a roast beef dinner for the afternoon, and uh, and then in the side of Cliff's Cafe there'd be like a couple of pinball machines. So we used to bunk off school, right? Go to Cliff's Cafe, ding 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 ding, play the bloody pinball machine, and then and then stay there all the way through until we had to go home from school. And then I used to go home from school, pretending that I've been to school, but I've been in Cliff's Cafe. <laughs> it did great roast dinners in there. <laughs> I love the fact you had a roast dinner every afternoon. That's so professional. There's there's a there's a professional grazer right there. No wonder you've got a vegetable garden and you've been practicing. But you have having roast dinners every afternoon. Um, <laughs> it was quite funny. But here, but here's the thing, though, James. After all of that, um, I I decided that the calluses on my hands were getting way too big, and I've had enough of scaffolding, and I'm going to have to take the plunge. 
between going as a semi-professional DJ or carry on running a scaffolding company. So where I was earning roughly about five or six hundred pounds a week, because obviously scaffolding was pretty good and lucrative at those times, especially of how I was working. Um, I went went to that to sixty pounds a week being a semi-professional DJ uh, because that's how much work there was. You know, there wasn't that much much work, but I just thought, you know what, I'm going to try and 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 follow my path of what of what I believe I know I can do. And what helped me really was the Prince's Trust. So old Prince Philip many years ago started up a uh, a regime where where you could start up your your uh, self employed business. And if you had a thousand pounds in your business, or you could raise a thousand pounds, and then the Prince's Trust would give you a thousand pounds to start up your own self employed business. And uh, and that's what I did. I I was eligible to do that, and I started up my own uh, mobile disco business, uh, which. Uh, that's what started. That's what I was going to ask you. Were you like the original mobile disco? Like you turn up in a van for a wedding, get your, get your vinyl out, get your turntables out, set your little lights up and, and that was it? Yep, 100%. That was me for at least, I would say, eight to ten years. I did some of the most amazing weddings that you could ever uh, remember. I remember doing this, this, like, this like, proper gypsies wedding, right? I don't know how I got this job. But anyway, it, it, was, something, it was a holiday inn in, uh, in, uh, in Heathrow Airport. And I saw my van, I got myself down and everything. Um, and I got in there and they were like proper gypsies, you know, you know, all right, boy, got to. <laughs> and if somebody that knew someone has got the job, they, they were going to give me cash, it was really good money. And I was like, I, I, I'm thinking to myself, what the hell do they going to want from me music wise? I don't know what the gypsy does to, you know? So anyway, I just thought <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get my top 40 records out, some rock and roll um, and some, some reggae and, and all sorts of stuff. And I thought, to be honest, if I don't get this gig right, I'm going to get absolutely killed. Filled in, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, because you're rubbish. I don't know who booked you. You know, it could be that boy. It could be this boy. Anyway, so I managed to save myself. And then to the point where they came up, actually, there was a fight, actually, uh, between the, the groom and the, and the best man, because the best man said it should have been him, and it wasn't. And so they had a big fight. So when I went on, there was all outside having a proper 50 cuffs. And I'm thinking, well, this is easy money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or I hope I'm going to get paid. But anyway, they all came back in. Uh, one of them went to the went to a hospital. They all had a really good party. I came in and they said uh, that was a really good set, boy. No problem. Here's twenty pound extra, and you know, and and good luck for whatever you do in the future. I was like, fly me out. And you got you got out alive. You got out alive with all your records as well. Got out alive with all my records. Yeah, Mate, yeah. <laughs> that's unbelievable. But so. What was your kind of first um, big gig when you sort of think, you know, where it was your almost club-based gig that you did that you were like, this is my moment here? Well, I used to, uh, well, live in South London, a place called Car Shorten. And I did all of the my friends' and family's parties and school discos. I did all of them uh, for, for many years. So I was always the go-to guy to have parties. And then I moved to Brighton, um, South Coast, uh, around 1983, 84. And then we used to do like Shabin parties down there. We used to do these like, like you know, uh, rundown houses that would fit maybe about three or 400 people, charge like a pound to come in and then another pound for a red stripe. And then you get me and a couple of friends playing all night long. And it was just brilliant. And I made a name for myself in Brighton because of these parties. And that's why I knew where if, if I was pulling people down from South London, they come to Brighton for the parties that I was doing down there, then I knew that there was something going on. So my biggest party that I had created at that time uh, was a weekend in Brighton at a place uh, called the Beach the Beach Hotel in Brighton, which you can still see today. And so I hired the Ho Hotel, basically got people to pay for their room for their stay, and the, and the money that they paid for would also entail it, 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 you got your the party as well, and and it's very cheap. I think it was something like something like thirty pounds for two days for staying at the hotel. So it was very faulty towers this hotel. <laughs> and we had a little function room downstairs. And then we sold like, I think it's something like for the weekend, maybe about sixty or seventy. No. Uh no, a bit more than that. It was two hundred. Two hundred tickets of people that are staying at the hotel. And then people that that come down for either Saturday uh, Friday or Saturday. So we had around about uh, a thousand people over the two days. And that's where I knew that you know I could pull people, uh, put bums on seats, had something to say in what I was creating and playing jazz, funk and soul uh, uh, music all night long. And it was uh, amazing to see that happen in that hotel. 
Needless to say, we weren't invited to come back again. Yeah, I can't imagine you would have done. I mean, listen, one night, one night only before the whole hotel fell down around you, but I can imagine it was unbelievable. <laughs> it but I, what, what, I love, what I love about you, though, is, is that you're actual, uh, like a grafter. You know, again, mm -hmm. the, using the rugby analogy, people just going in and only knowing one thing. I, do you think the reason you actually had to work, you set up your own business, you started from a completely different background, is why you have, have remained so humble and kind of appreciate what you have because you've you've gone there, whereas opposed to someone just making one song um, and having to go out there and just and publicise it. You know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think I think what's what's made me whole is is my family because. They worked really hard when they came over from Barbados in the late 50s. My dad was a bus driver. My mum was a midwife and on minimum wage. And, and I had three kids at the end of the day, which I had to look after. Um, you know, I, I come from a working family, working class family. So to earn money, you had to work. I mean, you know, I, I hate you being on the dole. It wasn't me just dossing around, just, just you know, doing nothing. And I, I've always kind of gone, well, you know, if you want anything in life, you're going to have to work hard for it. And even, you know, when when I started, uh, my name started getting banded around, around about 88, 89. I mean, people don't realise, in the early days of all those rave parties, even though the, there was 15,000 people or 20,000 people or whatever, the DJs were still only getting 100 to 150 pounds maximum out of any of those events. So I would pick up 100 pound or 150 pounds at one. I'll, I'll pick up an, another 100 somewhere else. And I'm talking, leaving my house in, in Brighton, driving to Doncaster, driving over then to Manchester, going down to Bedford and then driving home for £500. But I had to do three parties for it and spend all day and all night doing that. And I did that for years. So, you know, eventually, if you're putting bums on seats, you, you're going to get paid. It's, it's like anything, you know, you, you know, yourself. If you're good at something, and then, then the bonus is that you get paid for it. So for me, I just, the drive has always been about what I can basically do. What, what, what is my purpose in this planet? My purpose of this planet, in the end of the day, seems to be <laughs> me going out and DJing to people who like my music. So when things became a lot more affluent, a lot more sorted out, a lot more understood in the end of the day, um, and then obviously, you know, things become much more inf uh, uh, influence. But for me, it's, it's all about work. I mean, even now in this pandemic, I think I'm more popular now and, and working, I'm working just as hard, even though I'm not moving around now than I've ever been without traveling actually it's crazy my days are full with with all i mean today right i've been in a studio today um for this company called sensorium and i've been uh kind of filmed as an avatar today so eventually you're going to see me as this avatar that's going to come out and play in this enchanted forest or whatever's going to happen to me but it's, it's over two days that's why i'm in the hotel now this is this hotel is you know quite nice <laughs> but Tomorrow morning, I'll go and actually DJ as an avatar tomorrow. And then once I've recorded all of that, and then and then it will come out eventually as as something that people will be interested to see. But but I'm working, you know. It's I don't stop. I can't sit on my laurels at all. It's just not possible. Is that for VR? Is that because there's obviously a new buzz of the kind of that virtual reality stuff, and also um, I can't know what the word is projection. You know, so it feels like you'll be in the room with people if they wear certain things to see you as a three 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 D person DJing. Is that right? Yeah, 100%. But these guys have gone that much further than anything that you're thinking. So Hologram, holograms, or whatever yeah. is it? Yeah, well, it, further than that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> further than that. I, 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 I tell you, it's, it's just unbelievable. It's blowing my mind by what's going on at the moment. And what's really good about my avatar is that eventually I will be able to use my avatar in any application that, that, that it chooses because I'm already being... <laughs> dissected millions of times by these cameras. I mean, the cameras that 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 I was uh, involved in today, there was 150 of them, all taking snaps from every single uh, uh, angle, including my crutch and backside. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, it was uh, quite an interesting day today. But my God, you know, you know, when you just have to kind of uh, adapt at the end of the day by what we do, what we're doing. Well, that's what I'm doing, just adapting. I love that. What I, what I want to talk about is your musical taste. So were you a big clubber as well as a DJ in performing? Because everything you talked about was the soul, funk, um, you know, kind of reggae vibes early on. But now, mm. obviously, we know you as, you know, a top techno DJ. Yes, the vinyl sh sessions we're going to come on to later have shown you again in sort of your, your early light. Where mm. did your musical tastes come from? What, how did you progress to where you are now? 
Well, the thing was, I was always a, a, a club of, before I was a DJ. So I would be, be going to all of these kind of nightclub. When I was 14 or 15 years old, I'd be going to, to, to London. I would be going to the 100 Club. I'd be going to a club called Crackers. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be going to all of these, uh, where they were playing jazz, funk and soul music, I was there. And as a dancer, I was a, a very light on my feet back in the day. Uh, and I used to do the dancing battles with, with uh, crews from all over the, all over the regions and, and win most of them as, as well. It's pretty good. And, uh, but, but the thing was, I needed a DJ that could give me something to dance to. And I found that a lot of DJs at the time didn't. It's the reason why I didn't start to do it myself. So I know what it's like to be a clubber. I know what it's like to be out there. But at that time, uh, in the, uh, uh, well, late 70s into the 80s, there was so much great music that came out at that time. The funk, the, the, the jazz funk, the sound, the Latin jazz. I was just in all of it. And, and um, for me, that, that was probably the, my time where I transitioned from a clubber to a DJ. Because uh, obviously you um, you were in the uh, you know the early stage of sort of the the acid house and all the kind of warehouse vibe. It, did you really fall in love with the kind of the, the the romantic nature of the record shops? You know, so you would go to these gigs here, queue outside. Did you have a relationship with a record shop manager? Were you in there for hours listening to music? Yeah, I, I did all of that. I, I, I used to go to City City Sounds in London. Um, I used to go to Groove Records. Uh, I used to go to Zoom Records in Camden. And, and I just used to go to all these record shops, My Price Records in in in, uh, in East Croydon, uh, no, sorry, West Croydon. And I used to actually have a record shop of uh, my own. Uh, I, I took over My Price Records in Brighton and, and ran about 88, 89. Uh, and it's a Trafalgar Street. So you can imagine me having my own record shop to run. I had to pick up anything that was coming in firsthand before anyone else would get them. And I would say that my record collection the expanse of it grew because I've had that 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 record shop. I've just had everything. Bang, 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 bang. I just really enjoyed the fact that I was now the leader of of, of having the records first. Yeah, but that, that's and a poacher turn that. gamekeeper because you know everyone we talk to says they would go into a record shop right, having um, found, listened to a DJ right, wanted to find it, couldn't find it, gone into the record shop and the guy's gone. Oh, listen, we've only got two copies of that, or you can't find it. I love that you've bought the shop. So you can get the records straight away. <laughs> so there's no like messing around. If Coxie wants a no. record, Coxie's getting a record. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, you had to. You had to be first. You had to be the first one to play that record. I remember a record that came out in '88 uh, by Renegade Soundwave called The Phantom, and and I was at a warehouse party um, in Biggin Hill, and it was set up by Sunrise. Uh, entertainment at the moment, and Sunrise became one of the biggest uh, rave uh, uh, companies at the time. And and I heard uh, Frankie Valentine play this record, The Phantom, and I'm like, what the hell is that? Tune? It missed me, you know. I'm like, ah. So I heard this record, and The Phantom just blew up, you know. I was like, right, I'm gonna run to the record right, right, order The Phantom, get as many copies as you can, and as many as I could, as many as went out like that. So that was like a lesson for me not to miss out on any of these, these the ideas. I mean, you can't get everything, but also a trick that I used to do is stand by another DJ playing, buying all these records, and I used to just kind of look at the uh, the, the shopkeeper and just give him and just point the finger, like, yep, that one, <laughs> yep, that one, that one. <laughs> so so he'd be putting them underneath the t the counter, so they didn't know I was buying them. It's just like if you, I can, hear, yep, I love that one. So, so it was, it was all the, whatever tricks you needed to do. I was say, you'd have some DJs. Yeah. You'd have some DJs that would come in that you would know were DJs. So, uh, and, uh, and they were like hot, hot at what they were doing. So you would stand next to them, just hovering and just giving the old wink, like in the, uh, in the auction. And that's how you did it. Was it just to yeah. go up? Oh, that's hot. If he likes that, then I'm going to like that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't want to say, yeah, give me a copy as well. I'll just not give him no, and just point the finger and he put it in, he put it under the counter. And so anyone's gone and they'll be there you go, Coxie. <laughs> Mate, I love that. I love that. That's so shrewd. With, with your DJing, the the, the the momentum picked up really quite quickly for you, didn't it? So so obviously, you you know you were starting to do much more clubs. You'd obviously taken it seriously. When did you kind of feel like you were you were making it? And when was your like first residency? Um, I would. I never really took up any residencies. I mean, apart from being being in Brighton, I I used to do um, the clubs there for um, foreign. Uh, foreign students that were learning English. 
Uh, so they used to have a really cheap night on a Thursday night at a place called Toppers and Rumours. And uh, and the, and the, um, not the Zap Club. Uh, it used to be the Escape. And we used to get paid something like £40 and some beers um, to do these events because there was no real money in them. But it was just the fact that I used to go out and play like Peter Gabriel, Sledgehammer, uh, in the final countdown, and then I'll play some sort of techno record in there. So <laughs> that's how I, I was kept, you know, my hands in the clubs and, and kept working. But eventually I used to do uh, Sunday nights, which was my own night at all those clubs. And people used to come, come in their droves because I was playing at those clubs. And then eventually my first true residency was at the Zap Club in Brighton. So, so that's, so I kind of moved away from South London to create my new career uh, from South London to, to the South Coast. And basically made my name on the South Coast between uh, 88, 89, 90. Uh, and then 1991, then I, I moved up to a place called Horsham. And then and that's where I started to move up and down the country from that point on. When did you feel there was a moment when you were like, Do you know what? I'm actually doing all right here in this DJ lark. I know you said, obviously, continuously, the theme and what you said is you, you filled up venues. People were coming to see you. But there must have been sort of one moment when you were like, Do you know what? I think this could be a real starter for me. Yeah, I, I think probably 1988 when I was playing at uh, a party called Midsummer's Night Dream. And I think a lot of people remember that, that this rave party at a particular moment in time where I first started to play free turntables. And the thing about me playing free turntables, I was always at home perfecting the idea of free turntables. But I never really took it out until the, the one day I thought, right, I'm going on after all these amazing DJs have played at 10.30 in the morning, because that's the time they put me on, and and I'm going to get two copies of Little Louie French Kiss and one copy of Doug Lazy's Let It Roll a cappella. And I'm going to mix these three records together live, like no one's ever heard. So they've heard the records, but they haven't heard them mixed like that. So when everyone was kind of like just, you know, the sun's up and everyone's kind of dancing to some tunes, I comes on. So people are like, oh, I don't know, some, some guy called Carl Cox. But when I played those records, the whole place lifted all the promoters that were there were dancing behind me and all going, who's this guy? Who's this DJ? And my girlfriend at the time, Maxine Bradshaw, she had the, the cards out. She said, That's Carl Cox, that is. The free deck wizard. Bang, 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 bang. And from that, from that moment on, I never looked back. I love that. I saw your interview with Nick Fanciulli, um, who's obviously a legend and I know a very good friend of yours. Um, and he was saying, and you described yourself in there as the three deck wizard. And I obviously didn't know what the reference point was, but now I know. Now I know that it was all that time ago mixing that, and that's how you started. And that, and that was did that become your trademark? Yep, hundred percent. Because uh, because you know all the promoters then, all the rave promoters at that time, they booked Cole Cox a free deck wizard. So so they they get free decks for me. And what was what was kind of like you know no pressure or pressure is that a lot of people could at that time go right up front to the DJ, literally lean on on the front of the thing and then watch you play so i always had these like doubters or people like what's this all about the free deck wizard and i'll be like just mixing up a fuss bang 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 bang, bang. free decks you know and then you know when the people got their arms folded looking at me going all right yeah you know impress me and then they see them be impressed they're like mm, it's pretty good <laughs> you know it would be pretty good i'd like to see you try it mate you know what i mean with you know the needles jumping beer being spilt, you know, the decks, you know, wobbling and, and, and all sorts of things going on. But I still managed to cut through it. But I loved it because it was challenging. I, I was being, you know, kind of for myself. I wanted to prove my worth at the end of the day. If you're going to book me, then I'm going to give you this more than any other DJ. And and that's how I, I did it. I was, just was consistently just doing that all of the time. And so that's, that's where the name came from. Talk to me about your relationship with Ibiza. Did you go there before you were a DJ? Yeah, I, I did. I, I, I used to uh, get these uh, magazines called DJ Internationals. And, and what they used to do, DJ Internationals, was go around all these different places around the world and then basically highlight all the installations in clubs. And they highlighted Ibiza with all these clubs, like Coup, which is their privilege, uh, 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 Star Club, which is which is now Eden, and all these amazing club with the installations, lasers, sound system. And I'm like, wow, it's all in one island. I have to go. So to hear the sound and see the lasers and everything. Now, when I went, to, when I first went to Ibiza, which was I think late '86, <coughs> the music they were playing in these clubs were rubbish. It's all awful. It's Euro trash. I'm like, ah, this is terrible. You know. Um, but the, the installations were fantastic. So it, 
But I loved, I loved the island. I fell in love with the island, and I always felt to myself that I'm going to come back to this island every year, which I had done until last year. I couldn't go. Uh, so I've been every year since 1985. And the kind of music you're playing there, so the, so the locals in, in, in Ibiza playing Euro crap, and you're, what you were playing, what, Acid House, Rave, bit of techno, what was the kind of music yeah. you were putting out there? Yeah, well, I always played the conditions. So if I was playing, if, if I played Pasha, it would be house music. It'd be subliminal records, it'd be tribal, it'd be in a gospel house. You know, that's what I played at Privilege, because they're older, a bit more sophisticated. But if I played in San Antonio, it was rave music, man. It was just, just going off down there. Full of English, just go, oh, hey, oh, hey, someone like Coxie. Well, hey, you know, you know, you know, Shannon, play the prodigy, come on, play the prodigy, play the prodigy, your love, your love, you know. It was just fantastic. I absolutely loved it. And then uh, if I was playing uh, uh, Coup, uh, a privilege, um, which I had done a few times, I, I kind of calmed that rave down and just kind of played more progressive, more, more island, Balearic style. Um, I just played the conditions, you know, at the end of the day. I never really gave myself any real sound. Uh, I just wanted to compliment all the clubs that are on the island. But then I had this fantastic opportunity to represent myself and my sound. So I, you know, took on the, the realm of, of uh, being a resident at Space Club on a Tuesday. But actually the first night was on 2001 on a Thursday in the first year. And we were going up against Cream, Cream at the time uh, that were playing at... at um, amnesia so i didn't really want to do that so we, we changed from thursdays to tuesdays and uh and start from from, from zero but that was in the discotheca not outside on the terrace which 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 you know space became known for because i was right there actually creating the terrace from day one where, where I, I did a radio one after party for them and then turned that terrace into the club that that that, that happened eventually uh, that it was very well known for so i i kind of was very embedded and the success of that club right from the beginning. Because it's interesting that um, you talk about your sound and stuff, because now everybody, the people I always talk to, you, in the DJ world, you're known for your sound. Uh, that also, Sometimes some people don't take that into account, that you're playing to the crowd in front of you, and you can't just play. If you turn up and nobody gives a shit about techno, you can't just go out and play techno. You've got to play to crowd to get them going. It's interesting that you originally, again, were being a selector, playing what was in front of you instead of having a dedicated sound. Now obviously taking the vinyl sessions out, when people book you, they know what the Carl Cox vibe is is going to be. It's just very interesting yeah. that you sort of found that and then when you got your residency, that's when you locked into what we know as Carl Cox. Yeah. I, I think people really needed to understand, you know, my sound initially. And I, I've always loved drum and bass. I've always loved the rave sound. But, I, but it wasn't really my true sound. My true sound has always been about the future of music with a kick drum. And that future of music with a kick drum was techno music. And and that's what I've always followed. Uh, and then I've obviously very well known for that sound. I mean, I, it got to a place where I always played drum and bass or breaks, but I always put a kick drum on the back of it. So I, it was it was called stomp music, Coxie stomp music. So you got all these breaks. So all the guys that was at the drum and bass would be like, yeah, go on, Coxie. But as soon as I put a kick drum on it, they'd just stand there and just, just sit <laughs> I mean, like... You guys suck. Come on, man. You know, take the journey, you know. And I just wouldn't do it. It's it's either drum and bass or it's techno. It didn't you know, never the two should twain. But I got to a point where I, I, I you know with a drum and bass sound, which I love, that I wasn't professional at it. Well I was professional, but I, I wasn't live breathing it. And and other DJs were, like Fabio and Groove Rider, they'd have about, you know, fifty acetates and I'll have about two. <laughs> so so my two exclusives wasn't long enough for a set so I just said you know what boys you do what you're going to do and I'm going to leave that scene and I'm going to continue my quest for techno and house music of which then I, I didn't look back at all uh, at any point when I decided to do that with the, with space it originally used to be uh, an after hours club wasn't it it used to start mm, at sort yeah. of seven in the morning and what I was reading was about was that you you actually went there as a seven in the morning guy just to dance mm. and party, didn't you? And, and was that some of the opening yeah. stuff you were doing there as well, playing those those after hour bits? Yeah, because the thing was, I I I mean, I just went there to party and have a great time. I just loved the idea that you was at space, you're on the terrace, and everyone else back in the UK were at work. <laughs> 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 and I would just be like, we're having a great time, man. It was just, it was just epic, you know. Uh, and then there was Sundays at Space, which was which was a uh, um, amazing uh, 
thing to go to at that time. So I didn't need to really work there. But it got to a point where I was always asked to play. And, and then I used to play just house music on the terrace, the house music vibe. If you hear any of my sets on the terrace, it was always house music. But I had nowhere to unleash my, my techno sound. So, so I was basically given the opportunity to do that by going inside the discotheque. I did have a few, uh, I would say, requests about doing that because first and foremost, the sound sucked. It was just horrible, screechy, you know, top end, top, the sound of top end was like, ah, no bass. So I said, you've got to change the sound. I said, you've got to change the DJ booth because it was by the toilets and the toilets stank. So, so I said, clean the toilets and move the DJ booth, you know, to where it ended up in the end. And I thought maybe those demands would be going to be a bit too much for them and they wouldn't do it. So the next year, <laughs> they said, hey, Carl, you know, uh, we made a few changes. I said, oh, okay. Yeah, we changed the DJ booth, we cleaned the toilets, and we got a function one sound system. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I better take up your offer as a resident then. <laughs> well, I love that. I love that. Because actually, funny enough, now where obviously the space used to be is high, and they've now got the DJ yeah. booth in the toilets. So it's gone around full circle. The wild room is now in the, or the wild corner is now actually in the toilets. Who knew? Who knew that you could have some of the best parties ever in the bogs? Yeah, I know. I mean, it's, uh, I still find it a very weird thing to do, but they wasn't the first ones to do it. In, uh, you know, Norman Cook used to play the toilets up in, uh, up in Privilege, you know, back in the day from when they were doing Manny Mission. And, uh, and it was, I, I, you know, I, I can't see, you're going for a piss, you know, and there's a DJ in there with loads of people going, just having a really great time. And women as well. So, you know, I find it very difficult to do that. <laughs> it is a bit odd, it is a bit odd, but I've had some of the best nights I've ever had in there. Because I wandered yeah, in yeah. for a piss and three hours later I'm still in there. Uh, which, which, yeah, it's always a bit shocking. But just with, your, with the space stuff. So then how did it... So you obviously accepted the offer to go and do it. Mm. And then how did it build to what we, what we were in? Because you said, obviously, 20 years in total, but 15 years you were there. And, and I've got an embarrassing mm. story because I, I want to hear about your sort of adventure and some of the stories about that and, and how you knew it had grown into something. But I actually... When I was about 21 was the first time that I'd been to Ibiza. I'd never been. And I was just starting... Oh to get into house music. I'd always had an eclectic mix and I went to space. Yeah. And my then partner got me into space and you were playing that night. And I just didn't, I was like, I was on the dance floor. And I remember looking over and seeing you and your energy and everything else that. And I was like, fucking hell, who's that guy there? He's absolutely blowing the doors off. Anyway, was, I was out my tree, like having the time of my life, wasn't really paying attention. It was only when I got home and was like trying to find out who you, I was like, oh my God, that was Carl Cox. Didn't think any more about it. And I was the most embarrassed that I actually got to see Carl Cox at space before I became a super fan. I was, wasn't really paying attention, but when I looked over, I was like, that guy is absolutely killing it. And I, I was ashamed to say it because if I'd been an absolute Kino now, I probably would have been arms folded, like watching, go on, show me the three deck wizard. <laughs> <laughs> no, because what I was going to ask you was, it's almost like I'm going to talk to you about the closing because of because I interviewed Nick and obviously that's like regarded as the seminal moment. But I wanted to ask you really, were there any other performances where you you know you you had gone this progression, you'd gone from weddings to DJ, you'd made your name on the um you know on the coast, you'd come there, you'd come to Ibiza, you'd enjoyed it as a clubber. Were there moments where you've sat in that club and seen what you created and just gone, this is unbelievable? Like, you know, you're just looking out going, I don't think life can get much better than this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think once we got into year five of being, having a resident, I, I, normally when you do any of these stuff, you kind of go, I've had, I've, we've had a good time. We've had five years of this. This is great. And then, and then you think, okay, well, you know, people are not going to come and they're going to be bored. They're going to move on to somewhere else. It never happened at Space. I mean, I, I gave myself five years. I thought, this is it. We went into year six, and it was much better than year five. And then it went into year seven, year eight, year nine. Ten years of Space. I'm like, how the hell did we get ten years of Space? This is a Tuesday night club. We're up against everybody around the, around the, around the island. You know, we, we, we had a really great team. Promotional team, fantastic. But we also had a really great uh, uh, uh DJ selection, you know, we created the music, the, the, the club was behind us, every Tuesday was a blinder, the sound was better every year, the place was better every year, it was just, and then we, we were like a freight train every Tuesday, and then I thought, okay, well, we've been 10 years, and you know, maybe year 11 to go down, and that'd be, year 11 just superseded year 10, and then we went, in 10, 11, in year 12 was even better, 13, 14, I'm like, 
Blimey, we're on a real plateau here. And every year, you know, space was getting awarded, you know, from all over the, all over the world as, as the club to go to. So they held all these awards. Everything. Yeah, space the winner for this year. Space the winner for that year. Space the winner. You know, it was just completely madness. And then when we were told, you know, that in 2016, that Pepe uh, uh, wasn't going to get his lease renewed, um, you know, based on what had happened, um, that was it, you know. And Pepe didn't want to pursue it any further because... He was 80 years old, so and he's had a great time. Um, and it was going to change hands, and the legacy of space was going to change. Before we go into the, the closing, how much did were you involved in the club? So obviously your presence and the Tuesday nights and how you killed it on the on the uh, behind the decks brought people in. But were you part of choosing the other DJs? Were you given that approval? How much by the end was it Carl Cox directing stuff as well as performing? I, I, I was involved in how it looked how it sounded, and how it got curated. And that was over all rooms, because there was obviously more than one room. We, you know, I just want, wanted each room to be defined. I wanted, to, we wanted you to hear breaks in one room. I wanted to hear hard techno in another room. I wanted you to hear trip hop in another room. And so when you, wherever, you, wherever you walked around, uh, Mr. Doris was one of my favorite DJs there. He just played just great music, you know, where, where, from his mind's eye. Still one of the best DJs I've ever heard. But, you know, you go all the way up the top where the chill, chill room is, and Mr. Doris would be playing. And it just you, you could just be there all night. It was just bloody awesome. But, yeah, I, I had, between myself and an, another lady called Lynn Cosgrave, um, who was uh, running a company called Safe House, uh, that was our night. And then basically we used to work with Pepe on, on our concepts every year uh, and our DJs every year. I, I remember when we booked a, a drum and bass night, we had um, LTJ Bookham uh, down with MC Dynamite. And for the first time, and then Pepe comes into his newly made uh, 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 covered terrace, and he's like, "Oh, Carl, what is this racket? Oh, I don't like it. It's too fast. What is this noise? Please don't bring it back. Please, no, no, no." <laughs> we said, "Yeah, but this is the sound of London. This is, you know, it's going to bring different people in." And he freaked out, Pepe. He didn't speak to us for about two weeks after. That. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, no, he hated it. He hated drum and bass, but. The thing is, you know, the people loved it. All the people that came in to hear that sound had never been to space before. So that's what you do. You introduce a space, space to them, an, an ideal of that you can enjoy this, even if you're thinking maybe it may not be for you. But if you bring this kind of mountain to Mohammed and then they come into it, they go, wow. And then they go and experience another room. I think one of the most amazing nights I think I've had there, which stood out, was... The main, the main room, the discotheque, was me and Fat Boy Slim, uh, Norman Cook, and it was rammed. And he's playing his music. I want to praise you, and and we, this is the first time we really had a lot of his crew in there, his his uh, fans, as well as my fans in there. And then in the other room, I had DJ Marky playing, and and it was packed like you cannot, you just couldn't get one more person in there. It was ridiculous. So to hear these these two rooms really going off. And the defined the sound being so defined, it really worked. It, you know, there's no point of having you know the same sound in one room as you're going to go into another room the same sound. There was no, there was no point of doing that. So we we you know we had Giles Peterson, you know Laurent Garnier. We had all, all sorts of different styles of people playing. And Pendulum one night in there doing their stuff. It was just it was just awesome. I was so fortunate to be able to to have something that I could define what I what what I would like to have in the club. Um, this this was that, that was definitely my moment for for sure. I think you've got many more moments to come, Carl. To be honest with you, you know, I think um, you know to create something like that, and also to have the understanding that that people were going to walk from one room, you know, because that's the beauty of a club like that is you're on a vibe, you're coming, and maybe it's not clicking. You just go for a beer, or you go for a pit, and you hear something else, and you suddenly find out you like music that you didn't know you liked, and because people, especially when it comes to music and art, people think they know what they like and are quite entrenched and like sometimes too cool. They're like, oh, I I'm not into that. I'm not into that. It's funny when you're steaming uh, at two in the morning how you might discover something you didn't know. And that's like, like you know, that's how uh, certain things with music I had. I was like, oh, I'm not into this. I'm not into that. Go somewhere. And, you know, that's when my love of techno came. Like, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I started when I was into my first music going to Tomorrowland. I used to see you at you know, the Carl Cox stage and. Um, but I, I started into EDM, like <laughs> awfully, awfully into EDM because that's, that was my first sort of thing into it. You know, now I have much, you know, now I'm, uh, 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 you know, I, I'm really into my techno and obviously 
kind of defective style house that I that I play for my radio show with sort of techno. And it's amazing how your 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 taste changed. And for you to be a taste maker yourself and to put that together is pretty um is pretty special. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about the the um the closing party. So you know I've heard it from Nick's version. Obviously you know you. Uh, I remember that you sort of, according to him, you you know you called him up uh, and obviously gave him the opportunity to come and DJ, and he was playing there and, and did a, a number of years with you. Um, and on that closing party night, he was obviously supposed to do the was it two hours? Then you were going to finish off with four hours, or was it two hours, two hours? I can't remember. Uh, no, it was two. It was two hours. It was it's two, two and two. Um, I I had already the thing is about the, the actual closing closing. My my own night, the revolution night, uh, two weeks before the actual closing. Um, it's where I, I, I made my, my mark, my 10 hour set, half of it was going to be vinyl sound and the other half was digital, whether it's tractor, USB music, because a lot of people in the last 10 years of, of being in space had never seen me spin a vinyl in that club. So, so it, it was to give people the opportunity to really feel that club from its essence. So, and I hadn't played vinyl for like 20 years. This only four hours, something stupid. And so it was kind of like, oh my God, I've got to put a needle on the record again at space. I'm like, oh, how do you want to do that? Um, so so I was very tentative um, by when I started playing the vinyl back in that club again. But it was also very endearing because some of those records on vinyl, you can't find on, on trackitdown.com or Beatport or any of these download sites. It's on vinyl and it stays on vinyl in some ways. You know, your collection or your selections is right there, the embodiment of the music. So a lot of people, when they heard me playing the vinyl set for the first six hours, uh, five hours, they're like, where's this music come from? It sounded brand new to a lot of people. And that was just fantastic. I mean, I mean, the thing was, I, I, I thought, right, I'm going to just send this off with a complete bang. And I'm going to go on for the beginning, which is about half past 10. And I'm going to close it out at eight o'clock. So can you imagine that I, I normally go on at three o'clock in, in, at night where it's like, okay, you've got, you've got your guest DJs, and they're great, and everyone's having a great time. Then I come on, and I go right from three until eight, it's on, you know? But I went on at 10 o'clock in, in, the, in the evening, so I had to just kind of just keep it down, because every record, every record, everyone's like, ah! But I was playing like 118 BPM, 120. So just chugging along, chugging along, playing this record, playing that record, all on vinyl. And I just, I mean, I really wanted to let Rip ran about 11, you know, I was like, yeah, let's go. And I just, just didn't, just didn't do it. Just holding it down, holding it down. Place is packed. It's, by 11, it's chocker. It was just, and lights were down. Just keep the lights down. Don't, don't go mad. And just take this night, you know. And then, you know, 11 o'clock came, 12 o'clock. I went up, went up another BPM. One, you know, 118, 119. People could feel it. Woo! 119 BPM. Yeah, okay. You know, we're going to get there. You know, and I just kept kind of feeding it, feeding it. 120, 122. You know, now we're getting to like 1 o'clock, 125, 126. Now the place is moving. And I'm still playing vinyl, still playing vinyl. And so when it became around about 3 o'clock, you know, I'm up to about 128 BPM where I started going into Tech House Techno. So I'll come on, so I'll go, right, crescendo, dinner, three o'clock, bang, lights, smoke, three o'clock's on. And they're just like ripping it, right, now onto digital. <laughs> bang, this was going on, that's going on, this track, that track. Now it was all the records that people know me for at this club over the last five years. That hit record, bang, this one, that one, this one, that one. It was like five o'clock, six o'clock. Nobody's going home, the place is chocker. And then I played all the way through until eight o'clock. Uh, and then, I, and then I played my last record. I think it was like Promised Land or something. Everyone's in tears, and I was just like, "This just doesn't get any better than that." And that was my own closing night party. So I had to go and do that all over again in two weeks. So it was nice to be able to share the love of of, of the essence of the closing with Nick, uh, because you know, the, you know, Pepe loved Nick as well, and 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 you know, he knew how to play that club very very well. And, you know, me and Nick's always played very, very well together. I mean, of course, Nick wanted to make sure that I <laughs> totally finished it off um, because he was there right with me. But I had already played the car park first. So I played the car park from 12 to 2 and then finished that, that off. And then I went back to the villa, slept for like three hours, came back and then went on at 8 to 12. And then, then Nick was playing and I would play and Nick would play. And that moment was just absolutely phenomenal. And I knew what my last record was going to be, which was Angie Stone. 
uh, I wish I didn't miss you when you're gone. And I just knew that it would just bring on the tears. And I'm also, can you imagine how many people ask me what my last record at Space was going to be? Can you imagine how many people? And if people are like, yeah, he's going to play Strings of Life. He's going to play this. He's going to do that. And I knew I'd throw everybody because nobody was thinking about Angie Stone. Now, some people didn't, didn't, didn't kind of get it. But most people thought, what an amazing tune. Because in years to come, it will be it will be down on, you know, Trivial Pursuit or something. You know, what was Carl Cox's last record played at Space? But you edited it, didn't you? You made your very own edit of the Angie Stone one. You know, you put, you put a kick and a couple of bits. Right, well, I'm you? so glad that you said that because also people thought it was some it was someone else's mix that, that, that I had played. Nobody thought that I actually did my own re-edit version of that track. So it's so unique. If you, you, you can put as many mixes up you like against my mix, you won't find my mix. It's my mix. I physically sat there and, and reproduced that track and kind of reworked it just to give it that bit more chunk and that filter and a bit more kick, hi-hat, clap. I didn't change the song in any way, shape or form. I time-stretched it. So the embodiment of the song was still there. But, you know, as soon as that... And do you know how, that, do you know how I came about playing that record? I was in a restaurant in Ibiza, um, and I can't remember what the restaurant was called. And one night, I was there for a bed friend's birthday party, and the DJ played it. And I was like, that's the tune for the closing party. This is the record. And people were looking at me going, huh? What are you talking about, Kunsi? Uh, Angie Stone? Oh, there's, there's, there's soul and R&B. I said, no, no, no. It is soul and R&B, but the way how I'm going to mix it, it's, it's just going to be a track which is memorable based on that you've never heard me play this at space at all until the very last moment. And that's the record I'm going to finish off with. If I played any other record, you know, Prodigy, Your Love, or anything like that, it would have been too easy. That's totally too easy. Strings of Life, too easy. Promised Land, too easy. All of it's Name anything you like. Angie Stone, that was pulled out of the heavens, that track. It was, and it came to me. I didn't go looking for it. And, and I stick by it. Any, any time you hear that record, people go, my God, space. Space. That's... Yeah, I actually went there a couple... I actually snuck out there a couple of times to, to, to when we were allowed to go out there and actually, you know, stayed in the hotel. And I think, you know, Leslie and Charlie as well uh, uh, over there. And, and you know, we, we got to see them. And I actually met Javier, the main man from uh, from Mambo's, which was, which, yeah, which was inc incredible to, to sort of go there. And I saw a couple of things, but obviously it was very, very different. I love the island because of how beautiful it is and the food and, 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 and that tourism angle as well as kind of um, clubbing. But I, I wanted to ask you about the um, the crowds. Now, obviously, I know crowds are your bread and butter, so I'm not expecting you to put, put the knife in. But from where you started and the way crowds react to where they are, are now, do you think this VIP culture that we've, we've got ourselves into, um, especially in Ibiza now, will need to change? Would you change it? Because obviously everyone comes now with the, the mobile phones out and this kind of thing, as opposed to down, you know, down dirty and raw, there to enjoy the music, as opposed to be seen to be there. Yeah, you know? I think it's very difficult now because everyone's so has been so used to VRP culture over the last five years. Um, you know, they're quite happy to buy a ticket, but also buy a table. You know, it seems to be the the, the, the way of, of, of clubbing in some ways. I'm, I mean... I, I go to a VR t VIP table and I'm squashed on this table with a, lot, a whole bunch of other people who are just trying to steal your drinks. You know, <laughs> it's got, and then the glasses going everywhere and, the, you know, when your shoes and your clothes, you're like, oh, Jesus, you know. Um, and the, all the action is, is actually, you know, on the floor or, or around the floor on the balcony or something. The true, the true feel of clubbers is there. And, you know, it, I, I remember being at Space and then one on the right-hand side of me in the VIP area that, that Space created, was like these these Russian guys, you know, and 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 funny enough, the, t about two or three of them were into it, sweating, enjoying the music, you know, just like yeah, you know, they've got their space, they're enjoying it, and they had all their girlfriends there, and they were just on the phone, like with the back turned to me, you know, just on their phone, like you know, you know, doing some sort of like Snapchat or something, and I'm just like like completely bored, you know, what I mean? it's like you know, this was the VIP, so when people are looking into that. When they see people that are not even into it, it takes a little bit of something of the, you know what I mean? Why, 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 why now aren't they engaging? It's because they've been asked to be there for, for just because they can. And, and that's unfortunate with some VIPs. They just want to just look 
over the over the seats and just yeah I'm here but you know yeah so and uh yeah and you got your drinks and all that sort of stuff. I've always gone out to a club, gone through the door, I got onto the dance floor. That's where I need to be. That's where I want to be. And 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 I'm not going to text or phone anyone if they're not here. They're not here. You know what I mean? I know. I know. It's it's madness. Um, obviously I know we've been talking for for a little while, so I won't keep you too much longer. But I, I just wanted to talk about um. You know how how you've remained kind of at the top of at the top of your game, whether it whether it's because you just have the passion, because it looks like that behind the decks, whether it's because you've just you know you're so into your music that you spot things coming before they are. Why do you think you've managed to stay even even this pandemic more relevant than ever? I, I think in some ways I've always been what kind of one step ahead. I do have a really good uh, team around me, uh, management team, social media team. Um, all the time we've been working with these guys and girls for the longest time. And, and obviously they've had to adapt as well because there's no touring, <laughs> you know, there's no clubs to go to. So it's all about the social, social media aspect of, 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 of where we are right now. Um, the, the amount of, of people that I have on my Facebook at the moment is a point of being something like 2.7 million uh, 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 people at the moment. And that's all genuine. There's not that, 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 number has been built up over the years of of me being in, involved in the social media and they are genuinely loyal fans so so they're there for me the whole the whole time not that i get to 2.7 million i would love to put out an album and have a pound from each person buy the album and that would be like my first album made 2.7 million <laughs> i'd be like fantastic wait till the next album you know it, it just doesn't work like that at all as you know but but they're there there because they want to be there. They 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 kind of I I get more likes. Just the other day, I thought right, I'm gonna I'll be doing my walks and I'll get around. I'm not a sportsman in any way, shape, or form, but I try to do something. In the end of the day, I can't just sit around and do anything. So I decided, and my friends they said, okay, let's go and do like a five k walk. So I did a five k walk. I did it my map my walk and the time I did it in and everything. And then I put a picture of me sweating and I put it up on, on my Facebook, and um. It, it 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 went wild. It just went everywhere. Well done, Coxy. This out now. Bang, bang, bang. It's it's amazing that you're doing this. And the brrr, you know, one thousand people, two thousand, six thousand comments and likes. And blah, blah, blah. Right. I put out my latest album. It's like ah, oh, you know, tumbleweed. <laughs> tumbleweed. I'm just like, but you know, you're here for the music and everything else. Like, no, we just want to see how many sausages you can eat. Or yeah. what plants you can make. It's, it's, it's just unbelievable. But I think because of I, I, I expose other things of my aspects of my life, it's what's given me my popularity. Because it's made me more closer to people than me being an artist and 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 and, the, and you are the public buying into the artist. The reason I so I got into DJing uh, like uh, while I was still playing was I found it was the the nearest thing to replicate and going out on the fields to play because I would. I would want, I'd first of all, I'm a bit of an attention whore and I love music. So I was, I'd see someone like yourself at the front of a, uh, a, a, you know, a, a gig and I'd be like, everyone's attention's on him. He's playing music that he wants, that the crowd wants, that you're getting a, you're getting a reaction both. And you're, you know, you know how good music is when it makes you feel amazing. You can't stop moving. Not only are you mixing in, you've got the technical skill of trying to do that. I love technology. And that's why I, I fell in love with it. Do you still, can you put into words kind of the emotions you have, say say at some of your bigger gigs or smaller gigs, what you actually feel when you're playing? Is it like hairs on the back of your neck? Do you have that vibe? Do you think, if I die now, this is the best thing ever? Because that's kind of what I feel, but I've always wanted to know with someone like yourself who's doing it for so long, what you what you sort of feel emotionally. Well, the, the thing is, I, I, I when I'm playing, I exude a, a certain amount of energy. I mean, my step program is ridiculous. You know, because I because I just step 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 step. You know, just into it. You know, I'm just don't stop 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 stop. And and I I've always been like that without thinking about it. I always say to people, if I'm not sweating, I'm not working. You know, because you, I'm building up this energy within me, and I exude it every time I play that space, and I and I get to the end after I play for five hours straight. I'm 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 fucking knackered. I'm like I sit down. I'm in the office. I go, oh. Some, a drink, a beer. I get that beer. Done. You know, towel. You know, I, 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 I don't think about the energy that I give out. But when you see that set before I get, get to the office, 
I'm, I'm absolutely on this zone of, of a freight train just coming at you all the time. It's not over until it's over. And and I, and I find myself that I, that I get more and more energy near the end of my set. Some DJs kind of get like, oh, I don't know what record to play. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just throwing any things in now. I can't wait for it to finish. And I'm like, I'm like the other way. <laughs> I'm like, ugh, like this. Um, I, I, I just... For me, it, it energizes me, absolutely energizes me. That's why sometimes with the longest sets, I don't even realize that I'm going to be playing eight or nine hours. It doesn't. To me, it's a long time. It is a long time if you think about that. But when you when you're in it, it kind of goes like this. I'm into hour five, hour six, hour seven, hour eight, hour nine. You know, like you know, and then that's it. Okay, and then the police come or the, the management go right, Coxie, that's it. Or they switch the power off on me. You know, which has happened many, many times. Really? I'm like, woohoo! And you know, it's way past the, you know the time they're supposed to finish. I go, right. The only way to finish this party is kabow. <laughs> I love that. Did you? Are you aware that you that you've cornered the market on the coolest phrases to say when you're DJing? So you know, like, oh yes, oh yes. You know, Carl Cox one time. All those things. You know that you've for the rest of us. Like, I'm obviously a posh. Posh white middle class guy. I don't. I'm not very cool. I'm not very cool. Like I'm never going to be cool. I never. I never be able to talk down and Fitzpatrick about this. I never break into the techno scene because they'd see me coming. They'd be like, "Whoa, you're not, mate. You're not allowed in the club here." But I. I obviously sometimes. Uh, I remember talking to Simon Dunmore about it when I do some of the uni gigs and, and things. Obviously, they want to get you on the mic because they're not booking me to be a DJ. They're booking me to be James. You know, James Haskell. Uh, you know, whoever that whoever that is. But I obviously go on there. I was like, you know, and I'm like, hello, everybody, having a good night. <laughs> and I and then I look at you and you're like, oh yes, yeah, so yeah. I'm like, how's he got? You've you've literally nicked every good phrase and left the rest of us with nothing. Like I, I'm like, yeah, because then if you put you know if you do EDM, you put your motherfucking hands up. That's just too EDM. So I just want you to know that you've cornered the market on that. <laughs> Well, the, well, the thing about oh yes, oh yes is because of you know my, you know my roots of being a, a mobile disc, the DJ and everything, I've always connected with people on the mic, but I didn't want to waffle on on the mic. You know that was the thing about it. It was just short and sharp and direct. So, uh, so at the time, a lot of there were a lot of DJs not saying anything. They were connected with the music, but not personally connected with the people. And the the mic's here to be used in one in one way or another. Not everyone can can use a mic in some ways because they just don't feel confident in it, and it's just not them. And I get it. You know, you'll never hear Dixon go, uh, "My name's Dixon." Uh, yeah. Uh, oh yes. Oh yes. Um, yeah, it yeah. just wouldn't happen. It just forget about it. You know, and nobody and nobody's gonna want to hear him. Dude, just play the music. But for me to just just step in a little bit more to the people and to to find out how they feel for one moment in your life. You know, and and you're all here. So so when I get on that mic, I want to know you having a good time. Yes, you know, um, and I want to I want to to see if they connect with me in the sense of me being a human speaking to another human outside of all this technology. So when it comes to you know me going oh yes oh yes after I've asked them if they had a good time whatever, it's it's timing, and and I and I utilized oh yes oh yes. As if it's comedy timing, because that punchline is where the action is. It's where that down that downbeat is. Bang! Where everyone's laughing. Yes. I, that's what I mean. So the thing is, I I have tried to come up with my own phrase. And I've just <laughs> what I come up with, lovely stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I've got. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, what can I? Do? Uh, he's done. Oh yes, oh yes, fantastic, fantastic. Everyone have a good time. Lovely stuff. And then it's not going down well, Carl. I, I don't think I'm coming for you. So if you'd like, if you're bored in lockdown, you want to think of a cool phrase that we can copyright for James Haskell, you know, the mobile, mobile DJ, then let, then let me know. Um, but it, but it is, it is again, I think I, I, so I've seen DJs recently. I won't na um, name a couple of them. I saw some, some pretty big names and I see you DJ. And as I said, the energy, the words, I see these other DJs who are hidden behind their laptops who, who don't, don't interact. And it's human nature. If the DJ looks like they're having the time of life and, and you know, you want to dance, you know, if some bloke's like this glued behind a laptop doing nothing and just being too cool for school, I just think it loses people. It doesn't matter how good the music is. You want to know that you're having a great time because that, and also the, the the crowd don't know that it's your sixth gig that you've been on a plane that you've had one hour sleep. You know they're not interested in that. Don't it's like it's like when you play rugby. If you try and play a rugby game ill or injured, nobody knows that you've got those things. If you play shit, everyone just says you're shit. And you can't put your hand up at the end and go, yeah, well, you don't understand. I had an argument with my wife and my ankle was really sore and I felt a bit sick. It's like you you know it doesn't it doesn't work like that. 
No, and and that's the thing. I I played, you know, some some events. Well, I've been on death's door, you know, um, you know, runny nose, sneezing, headaches, you know, um, tired, you know, just over it, and and I push through, you know, to to get to the other end, and I, and I and I'll just leave the club, get back to the hotel, and just try and rest up as much as I can, because I mean, look, I don't want anyone to cry for me, Argentina. But the, the thing is, I don't like letting anyone down either. Or the punters down. If they waited five months or six months for me to perform, and I go, oh, I've got a cold, I can't turn up, I'm sorry. You know, they don't care. It's like, no. get your ass there. I remember, I remember when uh, play, I was supposed to be playing um, in Vienna or something, and then we had the, um, uh, the volcano with the ash, you know, turn up and... and uh, and, you know, no planes were flying or anything over anywhere. Anyway, so, you know, I said, sorry, guys, you know, put a post out. I'm stuck here in London. I can't get over to you because of the, because of the ash. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll reschedule and I'll get back to you at some point. The amount of shit I got was like, get on a train, get a taxi over, get on one of the private planes. You, you can't let us down like this. I'm, like, I'm, so, I'm not letting you down. That's what's happened. But they just don't get it. I mean, even that happened. And they just still don't understand. I would be there if I could. But the ash is not allowing the planes to fly. And if they did, they will crash because the ash goes into the motors. It seizes them up and they will plunge to the to the earth. And nobody wants that. Well, get on a train then. Right, okay. Uh, so you want me to get on a train now to get to you know, Vienna or wherever it was. It's going to take hours to get there. I'm going to miss the, miss the event. It's not going to happen. So it, it's... I just suck it up. I, I, I really do suck it up most of the time. Some people look at me and go, you look like deaf. And I say, oh, I feel like deaf. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, you know so try and hide it. You know, I said, sometimes I've, I've got like a towel and I go like this. And it's like green, you know, fucking mucus, green. Like, yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, I am really ill. And I'm going to get back, oh, champagne. How, how do you survive the... um? Or how have you survived the, the DJ lifestyle in you know and not caught up, not gone you know, because so many of your sort of contemporaries and people like that, they they lose themselves to it, you know, because what people forget is is and I was talking to this to Alan and I've seen it firsthand, is that you know, you the pressure you put yourselves on, and I'd love to hear kind of what your like craziest schedule would be when you've tried to do like th seven shows in a weekend. But what they forget is that you haven't seen one of your other DJ mates. So every time you walk into a room, Coxie, you're like coming down, they're going up, and you can't just go every day is like a party day. How do you, how, tell me about your, your busiest schedule and also how you've avoided not falling apart uh, during that period of time. Yeah, I mean, mo most of the time, what I try and set out before I go anywhere to try and rest up as much as humanly possible. Because the thing is, if I was on drugs, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am today. Uh, if if I if I needed drugs to do what I'm doing, I, I would have died years ago. It's just not possible to 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 do the two things in a professional manner. I've always seen myself as a professional and has a responsibility as an artist to perform. If I'm off my nut, uh, even if I'm too, if I'm drunk or whatever, it's irresponsible to be in that position because people rely on you to give them the best time possible. You know, they've taken their time and energy to be there to pay for you to be there. The least you can do is is be a copus mentis. So round about, I would say, 2001, 2002, when I took on the residency, all of that went away from me. It was, it was all about looking after myself. I'm not the thinnest man on, on, on planet Earth. I don't go cycling for 50, 50 Ks or, or they don't, I don't go like for like, you know, kiking and all that sort of stuff. I do keep myself in good trim. I, try, I don't eat fast foods. Um, I do eat really well. I try to, eat, try to eat as much as I need to eat when I'm DJing, when I'm playing. I try not to eat rubbish food at night. I do, I do generally try and look after myself. As, as big as I am, I always feel that, that I, I have the, enough energy to continue to do what I do. And I try not to take on everything. If I know that I can't do three parties uh, in a weekend, and I won't do three parties, I'll do two great parties, and that's it, leave it, walk away. But, but the thing is, it's really hard to just drink water because everyone's like, champagne, bang. Vodka, no problem, brandy, you know, gin and tonic, have this, you know, here's another beer, here's a chipito, here's a tequila, well, hey, tequila shots, Ooh. sometimes by the end of it, you think to yourself, how the hell do they have all these drinks and, 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 and still 
be copacmentous in some ways. But what one of the one of the reasons if between drinks you have water. If you don't do that, by the end of it, you just want to die because you've mixed all your drinks and you and you're just like oh. But that's at the end of your set. So I try to just stay on one drink if I'm going to do um, if I'm going to have an alcoholic drink. I would stay on the beers or don't, don't do the beers. Champagne. I don't really like champagne that much. A couple of glasses. A bit of ching with a few people, and then that's it. I'm over it. Um, when it comes, I really enjoy gin and tonic at the moment. This is something for me. I'll drink up to a point, stop drinking, and drink water. Water is the key to all of it. The biggest problem about having water is, is that when you DJ and you want for, you want to go for a piss most of the time, so you don't really want to keep drinking water either. So it, there's a balance between this ideal to keep going. As soon as you get on, you know, on the drugs, or as soon as you get get on the, on the, on the alcohol. These two things are like a car crash for any artist. And nine times out of ten, it doesn't go well for, 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 for anyone that's getting into that kind of party mode. It really encroaches on, on, on your creativity, where your head's at. People can see it. If you think about what happened with, with Norman Cook, you know, he decided to check himself in. It's common knowledge. You know, he was drinking way too much, partying way too hard. You know, it was encroaching on his family. And eventually, you know, he, he, he knew that his sets were... Were, were, were damaging as well, and his career was being damaged. So to the point, he just said, "Nope, enough's enough." And now, even still today, teetotal, absolute teetotal. But it, it was it was concerning on on you know he needed some sort of intervention, but based on what was going on around him. So you know to see him go through you know, go through the the tunnel of all of that was was really inspiring because he had done it because he he knew that it was important for him. So I think he was a you know he was definitely not the poster boy of what how not to uh, encroach on your lifestyle based on, you know, the things that you should be saying no to if you want to have a career. I think, um, listen, you know, I, this has probably been the most you know, interesting kind of couple of hours I've, I've, we've had so far on this podcast. And, and, you know, obviously, Carl, you've had an incredible life and what you've achieved is is amazing. I've got I've got lots more questions, but I'm going to hit you up offline because they're all about like set preparation and stuff. And we'll, I, I, we'll leave that for another, for another time. Um, I, I think people will want to get your... your, your um, you know your autobiography because it's been so fascinating i've got two two real questions for you to finish really and they're sort of you know short answers really is um is there anything left you haven't done that you're desperate to do no <laughs> well thanks so much carl cox ladies and gentlemen that's that <laughs> No, there's no, there's no, there's nothing. There's no, there's no one. There's no one you haven't gone back to back with. There's no venue you haven't played. I, I, I think I, I mean, my expectations on my life has have so over exceeded itself. Um, I've met some of the most amazing people, done some of the most amazing things, been to so many amazing places. You know, to to be able to play Berlin Love Parade at eight point one point eight million people. Like not just once, three times. It's just for not. You just cannot comprehend that, James. When you're there and everyone's listening to you, every single track, all on vinyl too. Um, uh, that's like the highest of heights right there. Um, I think I've really done more than I really expected, and even when I, even my drag racing efforts, it, it's it's phenomenal. Not many people still know about my drag racing efforts, but it's phenomenal. You know, I, I I've actually self-titled myself as the fastest DJ in the world because there's no other DJ that hurtles himself in a quarter mile at nearly 250 miles an hour from a standing start. You know, I pull those shoots and go, I'm alive! <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, and I go back around again to do it again, you know. It's the most fiercest, most fastest thing you've ever been in and there's not much else that can beat that. So, you know, you can put me in the fastest supercar and you, uh, uh, as much as you like, even, you know, the, the Bugatti beer or whatever. Put me in a, and, and my car will absolutely slaughter every single one of them of, on a quarter mile. Because people don't know that you're, that you are, you know, I talked about it in the opening, obviously, again, you know, we, we can, well, hopefully one day we'll do a, you know, maybe when your book's out, maybe do, we'll pick up some other stuff um, with the podcast. But you're a mad petrol head. You've got tons of motorbikes, cars, but not only, not, not like, you know, you see the guys on Instagram, you make your cars, you build your cars, you start, you know, you started with the drag racing. Um, I was watching with with Nick Fanciulli's po uh, podcast with you talking about, you know, you started six seconds, four seconds. You know, the, this is unbelievable, you know, that you had your own racing team and all this kind of drag race team. So people just don't know this because they, they only see you as, as the, you know, oh, yes, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and the thing is, as, as much as the music's gone along, you know, uh, alongside with me from, from a very early age, 
so has cars and bikes and the interest of all of that. I mean, you know, I was always on push bikes and back in my early days uh, with my mates, you know, going around in the in the woods, you know, you know, doing speedway tracks, you know, in the woods and stuff and crashing and jumps and all that sorts of stuff. And as soon as there was a 50cc engine on a on a frame of some sort of motorbike, I was in. So I had this motorbike gang many years ago um, uh, around me uh, on Yamaha's FS1Es. And if anyone remembers those bikes, they were just little tearaway bikes, you know. And we'd be down on the tanks trying to get like 56 miles an hour out of it. You know, going downhill. <laughs> it's just like... You know, and all we could hear is like these little fizzies. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure the neighbourhood just was so pissed off with us. But you know, I, I always wanted to go faster and faster and faster. So on a bike, I've, my biggest bike at the time in the '80s was a Yamaha LCRD, of which I have even still today now, which is an amazing bike. Um, and I mean, my collection and my motorbikes at the moment now is nearly up to a hundred. So you can imagine old school classic bikes, new modern bikes, and an array of race bikes and my car collection is probably probably up to about 32 cars classic cars some supercars in there car listen you, you you mate you're a brilliant man you're an you're an inspiration um we you know we, we touched one at the start but you've obviously got your vinyl sessions which you've done with mixed cloud you've won awards for them as you said you're up to episode 51 or 52 it was if people want to see you doing what you did as a three deck wizard, um, you know, and as you said in the introduction, I'll take the words out of your mouth. You said it's not clever mixing. The vinyl is going to skip. The needle is going to skip. It's going to reverb. It's going to there's going to be feedback. But it's an absolute roller coaster of your over a hundred thousand vinyl collection. They can uh, where where can people find that and watch that? Yeah, well, so what we do, what we do is actually is an introductory on Facebook, uh, especially on my own Facebook official page, um, Mixed Cloud. Um, they do put out notice if you subscribe to Mixcloud. They to all the sus subscribers, they put out a notification that the show's coming. Um, we do uh, 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 also utilize uh, Twitch as well um, and and Twitter at the same time it goes out. It, it is for free, you know, if you watch it at the time it goes out. But if you if you subscribe, it's three ninety nine for a, for a month, so it's like a pound a week, um, and then you can listen to it whenever you want. But you won't be able to watch it whenever you want. So it's it's something of which one of the reasons why I went to Mixcloud is is that I don't get taken down or it doesn't get cut, uh, because every artist that gets paid on played on Mixcloud gets paid. I mean, there's not a lot of money in it, but at least it's something that's better than nothing. Where Facebook doesn't do that, and if I did do it on Facebook, which I, which I used to uh, used to do in the early days, nine times out of ten guaranteed it would be cut off by at least by twice, and that was really pissing people off. Because they, and then they put out a notice to say, oh, DJ sets are going to be taken down, blah, blah, blah. Um, of which some of them actually are not, actually. You know, some, they keep going. But I think because of my popularity, I think it's, it's, probably, it's one of the reasons why. And also, some of the records I play, Warner Brothers seems to come in uh, copyright to, to ask me to pay for certain records that I'm playing, uh, which I say no, and they mute it. And, uh, and I just go, well, this is, I don't want to get into this fight. In the end of the day, I'll move on to another platform. So, so we're able to, uh, to, to be on good quality. You can still have your chats and that sort of stuff on Mixcloud. Um, it's very difficult to get people to subscribe to anything these days because they, they, they just want everything for nothing. But if you can imagine the amount of time and effort uh, that it takes for me to do each in each cabin fever, you know, with the lighting and, 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 and you know, the crew that I have to have to run the shows, uh, the recording, the people that I have to basically upload the shows, make sure that they're running fine, and all of it goes with it. A pound, you know, for my show is not a lot to pay. Uh, to to have something and, and to have all the archives of all the Cubby Fevers as well for a pound. So you know, you can watch it for nothing if you watch it at the time, if that's what you want to do. But I think it's not a bad bad price to pay uh, based on that. At least not even I don't get the subscription that money out of it. Actually, it goes to the artist of the, of the music that gets played. Guess, uh, guess who subscribed? <laughs> I, I was, I, I was happy. As soon as I saw it, I was like, I was, I'm on Mixcloud all the time. I've said, put my sets up there, and I, and I, you know, I saw it and subscribed. And you're right, but people's psychology, psychology around stuff is, it's amazing. You go and watch you live. You pay twenty quid for a Corona. If someone says there's an app to ninety nine p, you're like, or or five ninety nine, you're like, fuck that, I'm not paying for that. And then you go and buy a coffee for two quid. It's so funny how our our brain tells us when it comes to phones that 
in real life, this is acceptable. Digital art, unless it's free, we ain't paying for it. So I saw it. I, I subscribed to loads of things. And as soon as I saw it on vinyl, I was like, boom. Because I know, because what people don't appreciate, it's, it's you're working for vinyl more than anything. You're actually working. You're constantly working. You're bringing the energy to put that stuff together, even to select those records and go, do you know what? I was listening to a set the other day that was on an... Um, because some of the music I was trying to find, which interesting enough, obviously isn't doesn't exist anywhere, but in your vinyl collection or in, in other vinyl collections, and you did like a feature of a techno a techno guy that I absolutely loved. But for you to go through, sift them to make sure they're all cleaned, ready to go, to mix them, to keep them balanced, keep them in time, your beat matching by ear the whole time, to put the lighting, to have people to stream it. It may, you know, people people forget this stuff. They just see the finished article. Oh, it's DJ. No idea how hard that that is. So fair play, mate, and please. Make sure all my followers subscribe. Stop being tight asses. We're not. We're not. What are flanker fans are not tight asses, um, which is hopefully uh, the case. Um, the last thing I want to say is you. You were doing some amazing charity work with different people, but is it the Soundwave um, charity I saw that you've you've been doing some stuff? You're helping to raise some money. Is that something you want to talk yeah, about, so, or just some so, plug? Um, my record label, Awesome Soundwave, um, because I've been also uh, while I've been here in this pandemic, I've been working on a lot of live music as well, electronic live music with, with, with my machines, which I love doing. Um, the, my, my record label, Awesome Soundwave, which we sign electronic live artists to, um, we put together um, shows, like eight hour shows, with all the different artists from all over the world that, that, are, that, that we sign on the label. Um, and Christopher Coe is my partner on the label, who also co produces my music as well in the studio. Um, he's very, very well connected to Bali, the citizens and people and, and the residents of Bali. And, um, and they really need help. They, you know, they're. It's, at the moment, even here in Australia, you know, Bali, again, in the sense of tourism, it, it normally stays up because of the Australians descend on, on Bali like it's Ibiza, and they haven't been able to do that at all. So, you know, no tourists in Bali, there's, there's no money, the families are starving, and it's really, really, it's in a very bad place at the moment. So, you know, we, uh, the, the friend of Christopher Coe's has a friend in Bali who runs this thing called the Bali Crisis Kitchen. And with the amount of money that we that we we raise for for them, which is not a great amount, but enough to to keep you know many families in in, in you know in the realms of still having some food for months, and whether it's like a like a burger package and a salad or sandwiches, anything they can do, and they put them all in these little bundles and they send them all out to the household, which is just amazing um, to be able to to help out in that way, just because we're doing a live stream and uh, with all our amazing artists that basically they all give up their time, they're all playing live. There's no DJs there. It's um, it's it's phenomenal that we're able to do this with the platform that we're able to utilize and and get the word out there for you know you know for the idea of, of helping others. Uh, so that's what we've been doing. This is the latest thing that we've been working on with with Awesome Soundwave. And um, so we did the we did the, the festival already, um, Awesome Soundwave Live Free, um, and then we then we re uh, reintroduced it again just so if people miss it the first time. And then they can basically see that you know this happened and and the crisis is still ongoing and can you please you know donate to help them out and that's the the narrative of of that uh, charity well listen please everyone who follows me give carl cox a follow on instagram follow his facebook uh, I've been James Haskell interviewing Carl Cox for What a Flank It. If you like this podcast, please share, please subscribe, please leave some feedback. Uh, we're available at all your, uh, on all your usual podcasting channels. It's going to be a YouTube show as well. Uh, uh, thank you, Carl, once again, and I'll catch thank you soon. You, James. Take care out there, mate, and I'll speak to you soon.